overview here is that we are going to, you know, just basic, I'm not going through the entire um, educational process of teaching you how to apply the new uh, periodontal classification system, the staging and grading, because that's a course in its own. Um, all I want to do is just make sure that you're aware that dental implants have become a part of that classification system, which makes it, it just makes a lot of sense since that is also part of what we see every day and what we're treating. And it should be part of what we classify when we put our patients into a periodontal diagnostic classification. Um, looking at the critical steps, of course, we will talk about all these little things as we go through. And the main things, of course, is knowing how to assess our patients and radiographs and controlling the biofilm by both us and patient self-care, and then comparing the mechanical and biological treatment around the implants, and then identifying these modifiable risk behaviors and symptoms associated with the onset of disease. So it's just a little overview here of some of the, the goals that we hope to go through. Um, I just wanna point out to you, you know, as we all know, I mean, you know, you have to be under a rock not to know that this year has presented uh, variations in the way we approach our patients, the way we set up our day, the way we go into the office and the way we leave the office. Um, our patients that had been waiting for us to open practices when, you know, we were permitted to, uh, naturally, I'm sure that a percentage of your patients have had some concerns about, you know, going back into the dental office, not being sure that it was safe for them, um, whether it was really worthwhile if they only needed what they called a cleaning, quote, unquote. Uh, but... You know, you can see here that nearly three fourths of the patients in the United States believe that routine dental appointments remain important during the pandemic and that there is a benefit um, to going and it outweighs the risk of delaying it. And so, of course, the uh, Vivian Vassallo of the director of dental of Delta Dental Institute um, says, even in this uncertain environment, Americans know they need to prioritize preventive oral health care. And oral health is health, and routine dental care is critical to preventing long-term health problems. So if you have patients that are still holding back since March, and they don't feel the need to come in, they're afraid, and they're even more fearful right now, it, it is worthwhile maybe to send out some kind of a little email blast or a phone call to some people that you know maybe have had problems when they have delayed their treatment, that it is important for them to get back in. So I, I think it's worth, you know, mentioning this um, before we go further. Um, just to, you know, make you aware of the fact that in 2017, uh, the classification of periodontal and, and peri-implant diseases have been updated. Since the 90s, we, you know, pretty much have you know, been able to classify our patients, uh, come up with a formative diagnosis based on radiographs, on our probe readings, on our mobility, recession, and all of these parameters. But more than 100 experts from Europe, Asia, Australia, and the Americas conducted a very extensive literature review. They established the different definitions, but they deliberated on, you know, what do we need to do to ensure that how we classify a patient really helps to move us forward with their treatment and not just always base our treatment on what has already happened to them. And so when they established this new classification system, it was adopted very readily by many of uh, the academies across the world and especially our own American Academy of Periodontology and other associated um, organizations that have a stake in implant and periodontics. So, what this did was just moved us from what we used to do in the 1999, the last classification that was done, we based a lot entirely on the severity of past destruction and, and just what was happening at that particular time when they were in the chair, when they demonstrated some inflammation. And we always associate everything pretty much to the bacterial overload and addressing home care, and then of course doing the treatment that we feel is necessary at that particular time to get them to reverse you know, what uh, the state of inflammation is. But in 2017 with the new classification, 
Yes, they still look at the severity of past destruction, but having a record of what teeth are missing had really added another parameter to the diagnostic process. It looks at the complexity of managing the case and, the, and then estimating the future progression and likelihood is important when you look at the risk factors. Um, as you go through the staging and then the grading part of that, and I'm sure that some of you, if you haven't begun to really adapt this or adopt it in your practice, you may have read different articles on it. You may have even attended some courses or viewed some courses on it and feel that it's still quite hefty to absorb. Trust me, I felt the same way. Sometimes I still do because I'm not treating patients every day. So I'm not applying this information so easily and, and repetitiously. But I will tell you that it, it does make a lot of sense because it does follow a lot of what we did before. But additionally, there's some other steps that uh, when you start to practice them, you, you find that they are the necessary missing link that helps you to go forward with at least some predictability of how that patient will respond to treatment. The traditional perio exam still exists. We always want to describe the gingival color, the position, the tone, the size, the shape. This all goes hand in hand with implants as well. You know, the gingival tissue is really giving us a mirror of what's going on below, you know, the, the sulcus area. You still want six probe readings. You still want to evaluate mobility or missing teeth. You still want to make sure your radiographs are always up to date. And I think that digital radiography has been wonderful because, you know, the quality of radiographs have improved so much that I think that really helps to, you know, assess comparison baselines from, you know, one visit to a future visit when you take them again. This just gives you a little bit of a chart that when you stage a patient, think about the medical uh, field and how, you know, when someone has any, has been diagnosed with a disease, they generally don't find out that they have early or moderate or advanced. They find out that it, they're in a stage and those staging issues that come into the conversation help the practitioner and the patient really connect better when the consult and, and the discussion revolves around, you know, their prognosis. Um, what they can do better to improve or reverse something if it is a reversible disease. We all know that periodontitis is not basically a reversible disease. Um, the symptoms around it is, but you know, when you have bone loss, you have bone loss. That doesn't reverse itself. So when you have a stage that you're in, and that's based on what you see here is your clinical attachment loss, your radiographic bone loss, and then tooth loss. So when you see what stage that patient is in, in stage one where you're in the earlier, like stage one and two would be early to moderate. So you can see the millimeter pocket depths that are assessed here. They're not pocket depths, they're clinical attachment loss. So this is the actual attachment loss, which corresponds often with what you see on the radiographs. And then if there is no bone loss, Yes, you're still, you know, this would be in an early stage. When you're in stage three and four, you're really talking more about more advanced stage of periodontitis, but it, it's much easier to say you are in stage three periodontitis. You never go backwards to two. You could get worse. It could go from three to four, but this is just to the framework of, you know, where that patient is, the severity of what that patient has, then the other important part that came into the new classification is the complexity. You know, when you're looking at other issues, the vertical bone loss instead of horizontal bone loss, vercation involvement, severe ridge defects, bite collapse, these things become more severe in stage three and four. Now, when I go to grading, this then, you know, will give you the rate of progression based on you know where that patient moves over time. A lot of this is based on age too. When you see percentage of bone loss relative to age, that puts them in either an A, B, C when you grade them. Now this can change you know based on different parameters. You have grade modifiers, you know which of course if a person is a smoker, 
If a person is diabetic, these are risk factors that of course will progress the grade. So I'm not gonna spend any more time on this because as I said, this is a course in its own. And I think the only way that you really kind of um, digest this better is when you have cases that you can see and apply this information to a case study, you know, looking at, at the clinical information and then comparing it to the radiographic evidence. So I want to show you that, you know, with these staging and grading and the different classifications that your patient may be in, now with the new classification as of 2017, we have a whole section here that was added that addresses peri-implant diseases and conditions. So we know that a patient could either have peri-implant health, peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis, or the possibility of peri-implant soft or hard tissue deficiencies. So these are now the new classifications as they come through uh, on, you know, this was published. So if you ever wanna go and really look at a thorough overview and summary of the new classification um, in the Journal of Periodontology 2018. There's a, quite a lot that was published in that year because 2017 was when the workshop was held. And then by the following year, there was publications that were put out so that you, know, you can read a thorough overview of how to apply this in your practice. So let's look and you can see peri-implant health. When you are looking at probing depths that are generally less than or equal to five millimeters, um, absence of clinical signs of inflammation, lack of bleeding on probing, absence of bone loss following initial healing, no more than two millimeter bone loss from bone levels after first year in function. So when you hear me say pocket that's generally less than or equal to five millimeters, wait a minute, hold it, five millimeters. That's not what I learned. I thought that indicated disease. We're talking about implants now. So as you know, depending on the level of where the osseous integration occurs on the implant, yes, there's a likelihood that you may get, you know, say a millimeter or two apical to the neck of that uh, that implant that will integrate lower and it will also still be healthy. And if it integrates, you know, satisfactorily where you get good, strong support, and then that, you know, holds your, your prosthetic restoration, you're okay if that depth is four millimeters. That's okay. You just don't want bone loss. You don't want to see a change in the bone later on when radiographs are taken. So this is what you would find as your criteria for peri-implant health. Now, when you look at the, just, I'm just trying to move some things off my slide here. Mucositis, visual inflammation, red, swollen, soft tissue consistency, presence of profuse bleeding, separation on probing, increased pocket depths compared to baseline, and the absence of bone loss beyond crestal bone levels changes after the initial remodeling. So now we are not expecting to see bone changes, okay? You don't wanna see any bone loss. What you're really looking for here is the same parameter as if you were looking at gingivitis, all right? So mucositis is something that's reversible. It's something that can be treated easily at the hygiene appointment, and, but it's something that needs to be reevaluated. I think that's one of the things that are often missed when folks are treating patients with gingivitis, with mucositis. I think that you find that, um, you know, they treat, they treat it, they go over home care and they expect that it's going to respond. But very often they don't bring patients back to reevaluate. There is a dental billing code for reevaluation. You should have that as part of the treatment. They should follow up back with you in about 10 days to two weeks, see if what you had done at that particular time, and also to reevaluate their, re their home care to make sure that you know, you're getting the response you expect. Now, peri-implantitis, of course, I should have said peri-mucositis up here. I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, peri-implantitis, visual inflammation. Yes, you still might get some of the same soft tissue uh, inflammatory responses that you see in perimucositis, 
but then you start to see possibly some increased pocket depths that are compared to baseline at the placement of restoration. Progressive bone loss from bone level at one year following prosthetic restoration. So if you're starting to see that the pocket thefts are changing, but also when you compare it to the radiographs, this is where you really make the determination if it's implantitis and make sure those radiographs are, are you know, taken with similarity from you know, previous visit to this visit. You know, sometimes we get poor angulation, we don't see it, you get bone superimposed at the crestal area and you miss it. And if you don't really see that much of a gingival inflammation, you may not even see that there's some progressive bone loss going on there. You can also notice at times after implants are placed and the restorations are placed that you might find that the gingiva is not adequate. Um, it may be too thin, you know, around the facial, the buccal or the palatal. Um, same goes with the, you know, mandibular arch as well. But you can see that there's a little more exposure, of course, of the implant head. But, um, but this may be okay if that gingiva is healthy and it's thick enough to protect that. But this can be an easy area for um, bacterial adhesion based on how the patient is taking care of that. And you can see that the tooth anterior to that implant, you know, has some severe erosion. So you may want to really um, pay a little attention, take a little time to go over tooth brushing um, technique and that they're using a soft brush and that they're not, you know, but these Procedures that are done today, you know, gingivoplasty procedures that are done with implant cases sometimes have to be done later after the restoration has been completed. The projections of implant patient cases globally, general dentists placed over 5 million implants in 2017 with an expected increased prevalence of 14% per year. So, you know, planning, placing, restoring by dentists and dental surgeons, it's a collaborative effort. Today, many implants and restorations are placed by the same dentist. And of course, many different you know, general practitioners are undergoing certification courses to be able to become certified to place implants. And at times that can be a, a real nice you know, way of um, getting the results you like when that same person knows the restorative um, follow-up that they're going to do on that implant so that it's not really like, you know, one person putting the implant in and then, of course, having the other, you know, specialist taking care of the restorative. And if they're not really in sync, you might not get the results you expect. So sometimes that, you know, I think the results are really great when, when that same person is doing it. Um, maintenance. This is where I say, you know, in my title slide, it takes two, all right? The dental hygienist, uh, and I'm saying dental hygienist very loosely only because I do realize that there may be more than just the dental hygienist that may do maintenance on the dental implants. It could be the general dentist, it could be a periodontist, it could be the prosthodontist. Um, but, you know, depending on who that person may be uh, that's, you know, that is performing the maintenance, I'm gonna just for the simplicity refer to that person as the dental hygienist. And they are, you know, really it's their role to really know and be educated in assessing all the parameters that they need to know that implant is healthy. And of course, this is all, you know, all inclusive with your general exam. You're looking at natural teeth as well. But when you are really looking specifically in an implant area, you do have to apply some of the information that I had just gone over so that there's a little variation as to what you're looking for when there may be bone loss or there may be pocket depth changes. Um, but the patient is the other part of the team. We can't leave the patient out and they should not be expecting the hygienist or even the dentist to be the one responsible for the long-term success of that implant. It has to be a collaborative effort. It has to be spoken right from the beginning when they're going through the consult to get an implant, that this is gonna be a partnership and it's gonna require that patient to really look at what behavioral risks and modifications they have to make to ensure those implants are going to succeed for many years. And that home care, it should be a dedicated 
visit all by itself before you begin to do any implant cases. I think that we don't spend enough time educating and that's gonna be a really key part of it. There's diagnostic billing, of course, for all the different parameters of periodontal health, chronic periodontitis, aggressive periodontitis, even though those terms are not gonna be used as much anymore. In the billing, in, when you're doing third-party billing, it takes them a little time to catch up too with the verbiage that we need to match up with, uh, you know, as you can see in the parentheses next to all of these, I have stages listed, which means that this would typically be stage one, stage two. But eventually I know that, and I think it was supposed to be this year, but because of, you know, the um, challenges that we've had with everything this year, I don't believe that the CDT has caught up. And, and I know that the AAP, the Academy of Periodontology and the ADA, there was supposed to be some, I think, cohesion here of melding some of these terms and new billing codes and things into the CDT. But the implant diagnostic billing is going to include these terms now. So you're gonna to start to see this, you know, when you start identifying dental codes, that they're gonna have codes for this specific implant um, diagnosis. So the definition with your implant maintenance, it's basically a periodic evaluation of the implants, the surrounding tissue, and the oral hygiene, vital to that long-term success of the dental patient or the dental implant. Um, you can see here, even in the picture, that when the prosthesis is removed, whether you have a screw-on type, whether you have a cemented crown, you know, the tissue around that implant is what we're looking at. And you may not always see this in this view if the restore, if, if whatever has been restored there is not removed at every visit. But it is up to the dentist that does the restoration, whether they want to remove that periodically. And usually they do. Sometimes it's once every year. Sometimes it might be once every other year. But I think a lot depends upon what they might see in a radiograph and also what they see in the soft tissue around the, the crown that's there and how complicated it might be to remove it. Something that's cemented is not difficult to re-cement and something that's screwed on is not that difficult to reattach as well. But again, it, it would be up to the doctor to decide that. And you can see that when you take prostheses off and you're looking at these you know, abutments and the caps on them, you wanna make sure that you're not seeing soft tissue inflammation, bacterial adhesion in an area that the patient can't reach. Um, but when these things are removed, that's what your eyes are going to. You're looking at the gingiva, you're looking at the tone, the size, the shaping, you know, it is, is the enlargement or the redness due to something that is not fitting properly. If there might even be a manufacturing defect in the implant itself, these things can, can cause irritation as well. And we often blame everything on bacteria and that our home care has to be, you know, patient's home care has to be better. But that's not always the case. You know, sometimes it, it could be other factors. Um, not to um, you know hammer in the, the COVID issue, but we have to because you know the CDC guidelines right now are you know setting up what you see here as what you go through every day, and that is the pre-screening for your patients before they come to make sure that they're at least at least to their awareness are not COVID positive. Um, you wanna make sure they're not experiencing symptoms that are associated with COVID-19. Um, the day of the appointment, people are taking the temperature. Um, they may go out to the car to do that, you know, before they come in, they have to wear their mask. Um, you review some questions again before entry, even though you might've asked on the phone or the administrative, um, maybe you have someone that, that does your, your business calling and, and confirmations and they ask the questions, you know, beforehand. But people should minimize their belongings before they come in the office so that they're not walking in with a lot of things. Uh, I, when I went in for an appointment, uh, a doctor appointment, I just threw my keys and my phone in a plastic bag and had my mask on and left my whole handbag in the car because I thought, you know, the less has to <laughs> pick up germs, the better. <laughs> so I, I kind of walk in with the, with the little bag. 
Um, but all patients, of course, we know this, that they should be wearing a mask and that they should wait in the car until, you know, you indicate to them to enter and they shouldn't bring anybody with them unless the patient is, of course, um, incapacitated in some way that they cannot go in by themselves. Um, good hand hygiene. You know all the rest. I'm not going to even go into any more because if you're working, your practice is open. I know you know what you have to do. And it's just a matter of just emphasizing that before I get to some of the steps in the maintenance appointment. The review of medical and dental history, that's a loaded statement because, um, you know, we always have to update that. Every time you see a patient, you should be asking for any change. And that includes not just medicines, but herbal remedies and vitamins and anything that they're taking, um, topical ointments, anything. Uh, dental history, if there was something done maybe in the interim and they are seeing someone else, you want to make sure all that information is listed. Um, any related risk factors, oral hygiene, you know, have to go over what they're doing, ask them what they use at home and if they're doing it. You know, they, people like to lie to us. They like to say, I, you know, I have an electric toothbrush and yeah, I floss and now I have a water flosser, but they might be using it once a week. Um, you have to impress upon them how important it is for them to, you know, practice all of this daily. Uh, the periodic radiographs, decisions making radiographs are based on um, symptoms. They're based on the track record, the past track record of that patient. When it comes to implants, I think that decision has to be, it's very subjective. Uh, I know that I've often been asked uh, by students, by practitioners, how often should we take radiographs of an implant? It's, there's no hard, fast rule that it's every six months or every year or every 18 months. I think that when someone is healthy and it looks healthy, I think that you can probably go about a year to 18 months or better. But I think when you start to see any symptom, any type of symptom where the patient even reports a complaint, that radiograph should be taken at least on that site or that particular implant. Um, but you do want to do a very thorough gingival exam and document everything you see. Probe, now this is where it gets sticky. I just took a little one hour course the other day through DT study club or something. And the doctor was from Beverly Hills. He, he was uh, a perioprost, I think. And he was talking basically uh, about implants and, his, and the, the type of implants that he does. He does not approve of probing and scaling or touching the implant area at all. I don't agree, um, but I do agree with the fact that his justification was that you don't want to disturb the attachment. And the attachment around an implant um, is very different from the natural tooth attachment. So just for the sake of getting past this statement right now, I'm going to say if there are multiple people, practitioners that are involved with this patient's case, I think it's something to talk about. It's something to decide among you. But I do think that very gentle probing, and I mean gentle, is important for some baseline comparisons. And also just to see if, if there's um, bleeding points. I, I don't think that you really know if bleeding exists unless you do a very gentle probing. Mobility should be done with two blunted instruments, checking that. Now, you don't always know if there's mobility in an implant when there is um, a, a restoration on it. The restoration may not be loose, sure, but you do want to really evaluate that carefully because often you can tell that if an implant has some degree of mobility, you'll see some movement that might be a little more than like a millimeter of movement. And the radiographs will also help you to kind of tie that in um, with determining that. Make sure that you, um, you know, you have everything set up ahead of time on your tray and you're not taking things out as you're working, um, especially, especially if you're gonna go over any type of home care aids, you want to at least know you know, ahead of time, what you think you're going to offer the patient or talk about with the patient and get it ready. Same with instruments. Um, and I'm going to get into instruments uh, later. 
biofilm disruption uh, with minimally invasive agents and avoid aerosol producing equipment. So right now we have to back off the aerosols. Um, some of you may be shaking your head saying, sorry, but I'm doing it and I'm using all the protection I feel is necessary. That's fine if, if you think that you are able to do that and safely protect yourself as well as others, you know, in the practice, then fine. But I think you can you can do that with some low degree of aerosol and, and not a high degree of aerosol. The clinical success of a dental implant, mobility of an implant must be less than a millimeter. You know, so you, you don't want to see anything more than a millimeter of movement. No evidence of translucency on the radiograph. Bone level should be less than one third the height of the implants. So you, you look at the length of that implant and you determine the percentage of where the bone level is and it should at least, you know, never go any further than a third, you know, of bone loss, <coughs> pardon me, should be absence of infection or damage of any structures. And the success rate must be 75% or more after five years of functional service. So, you know, this is an older reference, but I think it's it's still very relevant that this is some of the, you know, the parameters of what we look at to say that it has been successful. Um, these are just some of those risk factors. And if, if you just kind of take a look around the whole, you know, circle, you can see that some of these things are out of your control. You know, improper prosthetic design. Well, you know, if you're just maintaining this patient, that wasn't, you know, your area. Um, surface modifications of an implant or occlusion and bone loss, you know, these things will have to be treated then by, you know, the doctor or the surgeon or the prosthodontist, if that may be the case. But some of the other factors have to be reviewed with that patient because these, you know, different, you know, habits or, you know, diseases that are underlying, they can certainly, um, you know, see a very short life for an implant. Um, smoking definitely has you know changed and and degraded the bone levels of many very healthy implants over time and parafunctional habits and you know right now during this covid crisis i've been seeing some articles pop up related to bruxism and clenching that if you are going to evaluate your patients right now and those implants pay particular attention to that and ask some questions if you're seeing some mobility because it's very likely that you know some people are going through a lot of stress and if they are bruxing and clenching they may need a night guard and this may be you know a very very important thing to protect the implants that they have should we probe so as i said you know i think that you know the evidence supports it that there is a benefit to comparing baseline at different periodic exams. So I think you do have to communicate among all of the stakeholders that work with that patient, have placed the implant and placed the restoration and decide, you know, whether you think this is the right thing to do for this patient. Um, but it's arbitrary. So just be mindful of that, that, you know, if you see a slight change in pocket depths, it's not necessarily attachment loss. You know, sometimes the gingiva all by itself, because it's dynamic, it will, you know, it can sometimes, you know, recede slightly, may not be because it's healthy, but it, it could affect the probing depths. But we do want to look at the osseous height from when the restoration is completed and in function, and then a year later to see if any changes happen. Um, if you are going to select probes, I, you know, recommend that you pay particular attention to, to the materials of those implant superstructures, but um, there are going to be different materials now because they're moving from doing mostly titanium um, to zirconium and ceramic type implants. Still, I think a plastic probe, even metal probes are not necessarily the worst thing in the world if they're carefully used. Um, but I, I think that, you know, some of the plastic probes really offer the better option. Um, so that's, you know, look at the anatomical differences. When you see that in a natural tooth, you can look at the gingiva, you can look at the attachment, the subclinical attachment that is up against the, the cementum. And you know that, you know, those fibers are on all different orientation. The connective tissue fibers have, you know, parallel, perpendicular, circular. Uh, when you look at an implant, 
you're looking at mainly just circular fibers. So it's very delicate and it's a different, it's just totally different because we rely on the osseous integration into the implant for the strength and, and the stability. We're not really relying as much on the soft tissue to be the attachment that protects it. So when we are looking at periodontal probes, we have you know a variety of different things that you can pick from. And that's really simply your choice. Um, but I think it is good sometimes for these plastic probes have a teeny bit of flexibility because the anatomy and contours of some of these structures below the, the, the crowns are uh, a little tricky. And sometimes metal probes don't really flex quite the right way for you to adapt the probe properly. So I think it's a good idea to look at you know, some of the plastic probes. There's biotype probes too. And these are, uh, Euphridi makes these and they're, these are designed for when you're evaluating the thin or the thickness of the gingiva. So when, when I spoke of mucogingival defects, if you use a white probe first and you insert it in the sulcus, if it's visible and you can see through and you see the color, then the tissue is thin. And then if you use the green probe, it's kind of moderate or medium. And then the blue is where the tissue is thicker. So, you know, they have different colors so that it allows you to, to determine that if you see that color, you know, you know, the thickness or thinness of that gingiva and if it warrants a, a procedure. Materials, you know, there are, you know, as I said, there's metals and there's ceramics. The titanium is still the, the you know, the standard. I mean, it, it tends to be the majority of the implants that you're going to probably maintain are going to come from that family of, um, of materials because they are, you know, more proven, successful, uh, strong, you know, and um, depending on the, you know, if it's a single site, if it's multiple site, you know, we still kind of rely more on the titanium based. The ceramics are, are really emerging because the materials are getting better. The tensile strength is better um, aesthetically. This is where the choice is being made for the anterior type implants or when that gingiva is thin. So, you know, you're, you're going to see more and more people maybe, you know, leaning more to, to the zirconium type uh, implants. And then of course, you don't see the metal through, you know, the crown because this is all white color. So aesthetically it, it really does. But again, this is very tricky because the person who is putting the implant and also doing the restoration on the implant, you know, there, there's a lot more physics involved here as to when and where you should use the zirconium versus the titanium. And then there's the all on, all on four. It's, you know, stabilizing a denture or partial on four implants. Um, I see a lot of this done like with the clear choice type implant centers. Um, they do this where people have uh, a, an immediate denture put in and then they come back for a permanent one, but they can put something right on it. Some of these are done with magnets, um, but you can see here where you have, you know, your implants, they don't do like seven or eight of them. They do four in very key strategic areas, and then they can fit this denture. And, and I know from my own father who had worn a full mandibular, you know, uh, removable denture in his later years, that having a couple of implants would have probably made a significant difference, but they just weren't, you know, they weren't the real, you know, everybody was doing it then. So he didn't have that option of going with implants. He had the dentures made. But when you're cleaning and when you're going over this with a patient, you want to be able to see, you know, what they're doing when they clean at home. Do they take this out? Are they able to take this out? Or is this something that's securely um, screwed in? And if they can clean under it and around the, the actual implants, Okay, let's look at, you know, peri-implant mucositis. You know, it, it could just be merely a little bit of inflammation. It could be just a little bleeding around the gingiva, a little bit of edema, but it'll be enough to say it's not healthy. And when you can see and determine that and you look at a radiograph and you know there's no bone loss or no bone loss changes, then this is reversible. Just like gingivitis, it should be able to be treated. Um, the treatment of it, you want to just go in there and, of course, debride the area if there is obvious 
you know, bacterial plaque or, you know, I doubt if you're going to find a significant amount of calculus, but I can't say you won't because there are people who do get an attraction of mineralized, the plaque mineralizes and they get pieces of calculus around it. And so after you, you know, I've had this patient back after you treat them, you want to see some nice tissue response when you probe it. Peri-implantitis, this is where you'll see the bone changes. So you look at the radiograph here and yeah, you might look at the clinical picture of this. You might say to yourself, okay, it looks like there's some inflammation, but I'm not sure that there's bone loss. Well, you wouldn't be sure until you take the radiograph, but you can see the vertical defecting there. You can see where there's much more radiolucency that's going all the way up to, you know, on that mesial side of number nine. And, and the distal is obvious that there's, you know, defects, but these are vertical defects that, you know, are, are not going to get any better unless something is done. You're, as the hygienist or the person who is actually doing the maintenance, you're not going to do um, a whole lot other than maybe what you might do when you treat it uh, a perimucositis, if that's where you're going. You know, there may be some offices that'll say, hey, when you see this, it's referral or it, it's treated only by, you know, the doctor because they may have to do a flat procedure. So, you know, it, it just depends on how much you have to do or can do at that particular time. So the peri-implant diseases with peri-implant mucositis, evaluate their home care efficacy first. First, take a look at that to see if you can determine why they may have had the inflammation. Compare the radiographs, document the soft tissue, careful instrumentation to reduce any biofilm deposits or the possibility of cement. Reevaluate in seven to 10 days and then put them on a close schedule of three months. And you could expand that to, to four, five or six months later if in fact they can then control that and it doesn't re recur. Now with peri-implantitis, step one and th to three is the same. But now you're looking at the radiographic changes and, and determining whether a referral has to be done. And then if there is the approval of some non-surgical therapy, they may determine you will do that, or maybe the surgeon will do that with a procedure that's considered more of a surgical flap procedure. They may have to decon decontaminate the denuded implant surface, and there may even be the potential for some regenerative procedures. In non-surgical protocol for peri-implantitis, um, some folks have gone to chlorhexidine um, using a soft brush and using chlorhexidine rinse. Uh, I think a lot of folks are backing off the chlorhexidine um, and are just basically using just an antimicrobial rinse. And if they do, you know, they're careful about brushing properly with a soft brush using maybe the water floss, and, and I'll show you pictures of some of the uh, home care aids. Some folks have, have actually used some uh, site-specific, you know, time-release antimicrobials such as Arrestin, and then reevaluate in a couple of weeks to see if that may have helped to control the inflammatory process. But this is all if you do go to a non-surgical step prior to possibly going to a surgical protocol following that. But again, this, this is really more in the line of what the doctor would decide has to be done. There could be the possibility of systemic antibiotics um, rather than site-specific delivery. And, um, and you definitely would have a person on a rigid three-month recall when they are classified a perimplantitis case. Try to keep an eye on the time because I tend to forget what time it is. Frequency of radiographs, as I said before, it's hard for me to say, oh, this is how many months I think you should go. Um, you may sit here and look at this and say, I don't agree. And that's fine. Uh, it's fine. I think if a patient is healthy, and again, we're just referring to the implants right now. If a patient is healthy, I think nine to 12 months, you know, stretch might be, you know, good right after the placement of the implant, just so that you can get a better look at the osseous integration, look at the restorative work. But, you know, again, a year after that, you might take another for a comparison baseline, looking at the uh, osseous integration then, osseo integration. Um, subjective decisions are based on sometimes the type of restoration you have, whether it's cemented, screw attachment. If there's the absence of symptoms, mobility, you may not feel the need 
to make the judgment of taking radiographs. Um, then a standard schedule might be somewhere up to two years before you take another specific radiograph on that site. Um, and that has nothing to do with other radiographs. If you feel that the patient is in need of a full mouth series because they haven't had them, then that would be a separate decision, but I'm just speaking only on the implant. The presence of disease or symptoms, I think that once that happens, your judgment on how often to take the radiographs might start to decrease as far as the time frame be from x-ray to x-ray. So when you start to see changes in symptoms and if the patient is more of a complex case and they've had uh, a quicker rate of periodontitis progression in the rest of their mouth, I would say then you would probably shorten the frequency of radiographs. So you can see the significance of radiographs where you can probe, but you still need to look at the comparison of the radiograph. And should we scale? Again, you get into this subjective thing that, um, and as I said, the doctor that I was listening to the other day said, he does not, he doesn't even scale around an implant. He teaches the patient how to do the proper home care. And unless there is an absolute need to go subgingively with an instrument to remove cement um, or anything of that nature, then he, he does that. But, you know, I think we all know that our patients don't all come in with nothing under the gingival margin. So I think when people are healthy, I would back off and I wouldn't use a lot of instruments and get in there and, you know, dig around. I wouldn't do it. Um, if there's some very obvious deposits, I think then, you know, I, I would suggest using certain instruments. Um, the soft tissue connection is very fragile. And I think you have to be mindful of that too when you select your instrument. So, you know, again, your home care aids are very, very effective. And here's your attachment. You can see what I was talking about with the circular fibers versus the complexity of fibers that are in the periodontal ligaments that are usually around a natural and healthy tooth. Selecting your implant scalers. Well, I think that we all pretty much back off of using stainless steel. I would be careful of any titanium nitrate coating um, those are different than titanium instruments uh, and titanium coated instruments are different. But some of these alloys that have this nitride, um, they can tend to wear off and sometimes they coat over stainless. And I don't think you want to have that because that would be the same as just picking up your stainless instruments and scaling with them. Uh, carbon too, I, I don't believe is very effective around titanium or zirconium. And we also want to avoid conventional ultrasonic tips. So some of the preferred instruments that people are choosing today, titanium alloy or titanium type, you know, implant scalers that are created by, um, you know, your, your better manufacturers who, who go through the right process to ensure that these instruments are high quality. You have fiber reinforced graphite. You have plasteel, which is with the unfilled resin. And then you have ultrasonic or piezoelectric insert tips that may have a polymer or a fixed peak sleeve or cover. And that will, you know, and, and you do have to understand that when a person does have, let's say that rebound right after having osseous integration of the bone into the implant, that maybe where that bone ends up, may end up exposing some threads. So in the event that there are some threading that may be exposed, I would be a little careful with what you're choosing. Now, there is a great deal of research that has been leaning more to, you know, using the titanium curettes and scalers as opposed to the plastic style or uh, resin style, um, you know, uh, scalers. Um, this is more of a surgical procedure, of course, but again, you can see that they're using more of a titanium as a preference because they tend to be a little more effective around the threads, but they also do not peel. Anything would not peel off of that instrument. So there are a variety of different types of implant scalers that do come in a titanium style coating or a titanium plating. And, you know, you can see, and, and I'm sure some of you have already you know, maybe looked at different types at, at shows or, or meetings. Plasteel, Euphrates has this, and they had even improved, I think, this material over years. Because I remember using some of their earlier ones, and the material of the plasteel is different 
than what their their original first um, generation of plastic instruments. Um, Premier has the resin reinforced graphite implant scalers. And again, I just want to emphasize that choices can be made for different situations. And I, you can see here where there's a connecting bar that connects these implants where denture fits over on the left. And then on the right, these are just, you know, plain and simple implants or crowns that are put on uh, the implants after, you know, the integration has, uh, OSCE's integration has occurred. And these work very well. I used them for 25 years and I had never had a problem with inflammatory reaction or peeling or anything. But again, I, I think I would avoid using this type if I knew that I was working on an area there, there were more exposed threads. So the resin reinforced graphite implant scalers, uh, we create, we make these here in Philadelphia, which um, you know we started to do based on our earlier design. They have a nice um, flexing to them too, so that you 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 won't find them to bend. But I think it's good that they give a little bit of, of give. Also, I I usually recommend them like if a patient has sensitivity root exposure on natural teeth because at times I used to find that some patients would be extremely sensitive to metal curettes or scalers. Uh, I'm keeping, I see the time is getting tight here, so let me move real quick. So you can see there's uh, also Premier, their implant cement is now um, a more improved version, which they call PLUS, and it has an unsurpassed radi radio opacity, which I think is very helpful when you know that Cements can be the one of the primary causes for inflammatory reaction around a crown and an implant. So I just want you to be aware that this is more radiopaque and it comes in two shades of pink and white. So that if you did like the Premier Implant Cement, but maybe one of the things that held you back from using it or using it in your practice was because it was a little more difficult to see on a radiograph, well, now this has a, a nice radio opaque um, quality to it so that it's easier to find it. Um, so there's that reserve on dental treatment, you know, because of aerosol. So I just wanted to point out to you that once you feel comfortable and things are safer for you to use uh, aerosol generating instruments, um, the implants, ultrasonic implant scalers that have a fixed tip, which in this case, um, the peak tip, has the ability to stay fixed. It's not going to peel. It's not going to shred. This is an advanced medical grade material. And it works so well when you have patients that have uh, a very difficult contour to their crowns around the implants that it's hard to get up and over the border and, and the margins of the crowns that this, this works a little bit better than hand instruments. Um, but it is a, a biocompatible. It's durable and heat resistant. You know, of course, you can autoclave these and um, they don't degrade with exposure to water or steam. And of course, as some of you may have already started to implement different types of air polishing systems, subgingival air polishing systems, because again, looking at what is maybe safe or easy to use around implants, this has also been something that has been reported in literature, has been um, studied in several many different clinical studies where they find this to be very effective. But again, this would be your subgingival airflow or the air and go, which is another form of subgingival perio um, polishing, air polishing. They use a powder, the plus powder, which is the erythritol um, powder is a little bit smaller in micron shape than the glycine, which works very well with the, um, with the subgingival inserts. So, you know, if you're looking to remove plaque biofilm that you don't necessarily need to go in there and dig around with a scaler, uh, a system like this could be very effective. You don't have to follow it with, you know, any type of profi paste. You know, this is really adequate for you to be able to work around an implant. You can also use around orthodontic appliances too. And then the Premier 2 Pro angles are also very effective. If you didn't realize, you could take the cup off and there's a pointed tip underneath the cup. And it's the pointed tip that I like because when you have cases like this, 
where denture may be removed and you have these copings and they attract plaque. And if the patient is not cleaning very well and taking the denture out at night so that they clean it properly, the prophy, uh, the little um, point on the prophy cup is really more effective in adapting around these pointed copings. So that's a, another great, you know, and then varnish, you could use a standard fluoride varnish um, in sites where you feel that maybe there's more of a, cha a chance of bacterial growth and the possibility of um, some other, you know, inflammation. And I think we already covered that. Here's some different ideas on implant care. Now, this is what you really have to spend time with them and show them how to use because using threaders are not easy when you have implants in the posterior teeth. I know it for my, my own. I have an implant up on the upper left and just because of the positioning of it, you know, in relation to the vestibular and the palatal areas, it's hard sometimes to get, you know, your threaders up and through. So it's good to take the time with them and show them. Some of these little rubber, you know, interproximal tips are nice. Um, I like thicker floss. I like something that has more of a gauzy effect. I think that really cleans well. And then your third party billing, I just wanted to point out to you that, you know, whether you're using a periodic oral evaluation and then periodontal maintenance, because you may have had a patient on having periodontal treatment initially, now you know that if a person is in fact classified perimucositis, there is a dental billing code for that. And then all these adjunctive services on the left um, are also you know, effective dental coding. If you need to review any of this as a result of you know, this implant being in danger because a patient needs to go through tobacco counseling or needs um, a half hour's time to go through some pretty elaborate oral hygiene instruction, use those codes, even if they don't pay them, it's good for them to be listed so that it shows that the metrics show that these are important services. Um, so five key tips, effective communication, accurate documentation um, among all the key providers, all the stakeholders that are maintaining the mutual patient. Make your patient responsible as a partner. Don't make it seem as though it's always up to you to take care of them. Um, but that it is their responsibility because what happens in their mouth on a daily basis has the greater impact than what you do every three months. Take some cautious steps in the probing in choosing your instruments and understanding the implant and the restoration, close attention to changes in the gingival tissue and the radiographic bone level, and spend a few extra minutes discussing those best home practices, um, you know, because that's, that's really the key thing. Um, but have a good evening and thanks again. Premier Dental, inspired solutions for daily dentistry.